This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Hello, good people. Welcome to this episode of 10 Things here on KC Sports Network. I'm BJ Kissel, and uh, we're going to be, after this week, be hanging out. We have a new co host of this show, Haley Lewis. Uh, I've had a chance to catch her on the KCSN Live post game show last night with Craig Stout and Ken Swanson. She did a phenomenal job, but she's going to be joining us every week. We're excited to have Haley be a part of what we're doing here at KC Sports Network. And thank you to the new presenting sponsor of this show, 10 Things, uh, Miss Mission Taco Joint. There's three locations now in Kansas City, including their new spot out in Leewood. If you go in to any of the three Mission Taco locations in Kansas City on Tuesdays and mention KC Sports Network, you will get 10% off your bill. Tacos, Tuesdays, they just seem to go together. And not only do we appreciate Mission Taco Joint for being the presenting sponsor of this show, they also have partnered with the KCSN Foundation to provide meals once a month to Oak Faith Ministries to continue the Feed It Forward program that we started a couple of years ago when we launched KC Sports Network. Huge thank you to Mission Taco Joint and the three locations in Kansas City for partnering with us to help feed the homeless population in Kansas City. We'll have more information on that if you want to support it. Uh, you can find the link in the description of the podcast and the YouTube video below to get you a link to the Give Butter page if you want to help support uh, our foundation and the different things that we do. Uh, if this is your first time checking out 10 things, uh, whether you're, again, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast, this show is just a lot of meat. It's a lot of information. Again, we'll have Haley with us uh, going forward on this show. But for this one, following the Chiefs preseason game, only so many takeaways that you could have from a preseason game because they're not game planning. They're not exploiting matchups. They're not doing all the things to try and win a game. They're trying to get uh, some evaluations done with these younger players and get them some reps, get them comfortable in a game environment. At the NFL level, a lot of times, and for a lot of the guys who played a majority of the snaps yesterday, um, it was the first time they've been out there uh, playing in this situation or at least playing in the role that they're trying to earn for a Chiefs team that is trying to win the Super Bowl for the second straight year. It'd be the first team to go back-to-back uh, in quite a while. But again, thank you for Mission Taco uh, for sponsoring this show and and supporting our foundation. I appreciate everybody out there who's listening. Appreciate Tucker Franklin for producing this show and Joel Prestill for promoting and all the people we have involved with KC Sports Network. Let's get right into this. And the first one is actually not going to be about the game. It was just about information that came out um, Monday morning uh, after the game. And that was Chris Jones, the latest in the Chris Jones Kansas City Chiefs contract situation uh, tweeting out, ain't nobody safe. That was Chris Jones' tweet earlier today, and a lot of the comments below that seem to be Chiefs fans just being tired of this situation. Um, I've spoke about it, you know, leading into this, kind of understanding there was a good chance it was going to get to this point. Uh, we've talked about over the last few weeks, at least it off off camera and off, you know, away from the microphones, just that it's unique in the situation that the Chiefs and Chris Jones and his representatives find themselves because dissimilar to a lot of other positions, there's a $7 million per year gap between the highest paid defensive tackle in football and Aaron Donald at $31 million a year and Quinnen Williams at $24 million who just signed his deal with the New York Jets a few weeks ago at 24. So that $7 million gap is a lot larger than you would find for other positions. I think that's why we're in this position where there's always negotiating. We've seen it with Justin Houston. We saw it with Eric Berry, saw it with Jamal Charles, Derek Johnson, all these guys that whether it's a delay, a holdout, whatever you want to call it, the gaps between what they thought they should get paid on where they slotted um, rankings across the league and where the next guy was, just kind of that gap between, it's normally a lot smaller. So you're normally not haggling over um, as much money as we are here. Again, talking $7 million difference per year between the highest paid and the second highest paid. Where do you split the difference and go right down the middle? Do you sway closer to the $24 million that Quinn and Williams is asking without knowing the details of what's going on? I'm assuming what's happening is the Chiefs are maybe offering just a little bit more than Quinn and or right out what Quinn and got. And Chris Jones and his people want closer to what Aaron Donald got and reset that market. A lot of other defensive linemen around the league that are paying attention to what's happening is that's going to set the market for when they go into negotiations as well. And they've got to be fair uh, for that as well. So I've said from the beginning, my 1A is Chris Jones gets paid. My 1B is that it's in Kansas City and he's a long-term member of the Chiefs. As somebody who's been around him, somebody who empathizes with the players in these situations that they spend their entire lives preparing to try and be healthy and at their best 
in a moment where they've set themselves up to get paid, not just for themselves and not just for their immediate family, but their extended family, their grandkids, their great grandkids will be affected by what's happening right now and the deal that is struck. Again, players, especially at the NFL level, it's the most popular sport in our country. You look at contracts for basketball players, individual, I know there's less players. I get all of that. But from a player's perspective, what these guys put on the line, what they've done, what Chris Jones has done for this organization since he stepped foot in here. I don't say as a kid because he was still a grown man at that point, but a young player who was working his way, trying to figure out the best way to be a professional, the best way to develop as a player. And he's done that, becoming one of the most dominating defensive tackles in the game. It says a lot about your organization and to everyone involved with it that you take care of the players that come in that develop, do the right things, help you win two Super Bowls, and you take care of that guy. On the flip side, I also understand, and this is a blanket statement that I've made the case for outside of any position other than quarterback, that I am never going to disagree with a faction of fans who think more on the business side and the more on the, hey, you only have so many resources that you can pass around. How much money is it? I understand, I should say, the take that, you never want to make anybody outside a quarterback the highest paid player at his respective position. We made this case with Tyree Kill that never going to blame the Chiefs for not wanting to make Tyree Kill the number one or number two highest paid player. It has nothing to do with Tyreek as a player. It has nothing to do with Chris as a player. You can switch that, again, with any position in the NFL outside of quarterback. Never going to blame an organization for not wanting to do that because the player is worth that kind of money. You can trade him and get some value back. You can use that money to spread it around to different positions. There's a case that can always be made that the totality of what you can do with those resources, with draft picks in return, and money on different players, that it can help your team. That being said, pay Chris what he wants. I want Chris Jones to get paid. I want him to be in Kansas City. I want him to retire a Kansas City Chief, or at least to be remembered as a Kansas City Chief when it's all said and done. He's been dominant here. He's earned the money. Go get it done. Hopefully both sides can compromise, meet in, the little, meet in the middle a little bit. We don't know where those things are at, but we do know based on over the last week what's been on social media that things aren't necessarily great at this point when things start getting leaked about Chiefs not wanting to make him the highest paid player in his position. That information is put out for a reason. Same reason as Chris going out and tweeting and using Michael Bay on Instagram to put out messages. It's just this is where it starts to get annoying for everyone who's involved because we know Chris wants to be here, know the organization loves him. It's negotiating, it's business, but you don't want to cross lines and you don't want to piss people off on either side and go across things that you can't take back. So that's the annoying part of this. Hopefully they get it figured out. I've said before, I think he needs at least two weeks to get ready. So we've got about 10 days here that I, for me personally, think he needs to be there in order for him to be ready, healthy, and at his best or close to his best for that September 7th game, opening up the season against the Detroit Lions. I think he needs two weeks, which means we've got about 10 days to get Chris here. So that is the number one, it's the longest take or longest point that we've got uh, for this episode of 10 Things. Number two, uh, not a huge take, he didn't play a lot, but Patrick Mahomes is always going to be near the top when we do 10 things. The number two thing, completed the two passes that he threw uh, for 15 yards, had the one scramble that I've already seen people say, it was a clean pocket. Maybe he just wanted to get there. Maybe he just wanted that adrenaline going and to know what that felt like when he left the pocket. But Donovan Smith did a great job. Saw somebody draw attention to that on social media. But biggest thing, Patrick Mahomes, he got out there, got a little work in, didn't get didn't get hurt um, as the number one thing for everybody. I think we walked away with two injuries, uh, Witherspoon and Nick Jones with the two injuries, not to take anything away. And I'm sorry if Nick Jones or Witherspoon's mom, I apologize, not saying it's not a big deal that they got hurt but they're not starters as it relates to the Chiefs and what they got to get ready for the Detroit Lions. Nothing as far as preseason week one, no injuries, and that's the most important thing if we're really being honest about this. Uh, let's move on to number three. It's probably going to be another long segment because he's been the darling of the Chiefs offseason. That is wide receiver Justin Ross, who some people on our network, including myself, had tempered expectations saying, hey, let's make sure this guy earns a roster spot before we start plugging him in. And in the context back then was, we don't need DeAndre Hopkins because we have Justin Ross. That made me laugh a little bit. I've seen some some people out there and I've heard some people say some things about KCSN hates John Ross because they thought he was a practice squad guy. Speaking for myself, 
I needed him to prove it because I've seen it year after year after year where we fall in love with guys during OTAs before they've ever proven it. Make sure they can get out there and prove it during an NFL game before you hand them a position or use it to say, we don't need one of the top three receivers in football because this rookie who was on IR last year, who was really good in college, is going to step in and absolutely kill it. Let them go kill it. Then you can get really excited, was my take from the beginning. But it's shown and it's proven over since training camp all the way to now that he's checking all of those boxes. He's proving it uh, when the pads came on at training camp. Now he's proving it uh, under the lights in a preseason game. Now he wasn't out there in the four or five snaps that Patrick Mahomes was out there. Justin Ross was not on the field with him. Not to say anything other than it's another checkpoint on the way for Justin Ross stepping up and having a season. I, I really would be interested on the splits between what Chiefs fans expect from Justin Ross, even today in the regular season. Do you expect him to have more than 450 yards receiving? Do you think he's going to have 800 yards receiving? There are people out there that are going to think he has 800 yards receiving. My guess would be somewhere between three and 400 at this point if he gets out on the field. Because again, my, my expectations are tempered because you can't just go from not playing, playing in college, not playing for a year, and then crushing it at the NFL level, particularly in this division with some of the best young cornerbacks in the NFL and defensive minds and people that are trying to do everything they can to not only slow down Patrick Mahomes, you can slow down the receivers to not be in the right spot with as many option routes as they run, you're going to have success. So there's a lot that Justin Ross is still going to have to work through, but the talent, the length, the natural ability, it's all there. It's been a great sign. Um, and I'm sure after the 15-yard touchdown he got from Shane Bouchel, I'm sure things will really slow down <laughs> for the, Pat, or the Justin Ross hype train that had gotten out of control so far uh, this season there for a little bit. And just in general, beyond Justin Ross, thought we saw some flashes from the rookies on the offensive side. Generic Prince, big storyline for him coming into this game that Dave Tobe came out going to be a kick returner. He's for the preseason. And then Rasheed Rice had some nice plays, had three catches for third yards to finish that nice debut for him at the NFL level. And just getting, again, used to the machinations of game day. What's it like at the NFL level? When you get in the locker room, you get dressed. What's your kind of pregame routine like that? All of those things that these guys at this level have never gone through, those are the kinds of things that get these guys comfortable with what's my process to get dressed, get out on the field, um, get comfortable with things. So by the time you get to a regular season game, already gone through it a little bit you know what to expect uh but shout out to the chiefs offensive rookies outside of justin ross uh that stepped up and had a good had a good game all right and when we cut we're gonna take a quick break right now when we come back we're going to talk about the fact that if it wasn't a preseason game and there were play calls like we saw on saturday we'd be talking about perhaps the worst play call in chiefs history which is saying something we'll be right back after this Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. All right, welcome back to 10 Things. I'm BJ Kissel. Hanging out, thanks to our friends at Mission Taco. Join Haley Lewis will be joining us next week for the first episode. But uh, going into the break, tease that, you know, if it wasn't preseason, we call it the worst play call in NFL history. Uh, I actually had a call from my mom, said, hey, how do you feel? You know, the Chiefs lost how I feel is if the chiefs call a third and eight screen pass up by one with under a minute to go, like on their own 20 yard line in a regular season game and the passes, excuse me, intercepted every right pitchforks, all the stuff that we see on social, you'll be very warranted if that happens in a regular season game, but it didn't, it happened in a preseason game. Didn't stop the, the pitchforks and the, the angry Twitter mob, uh, excuse me, angry X mob that we're calling it now. Talk. I keep calling it Twitter. Um, but, there's no game planning. We saw the play calling. I actually think I saw Tuck in the background, Andy Reid kind of smirking after the interception. They were showing somebody up close, and you go back and watch the broadcast. I could have swore I saw him in the background, kind of a little smirk on his face. Uh, not quite the Drew Tranquil smirk, which was a full-on like belly laugh, because that's what I was doing um, here at the KCSN World Headquarters, uh, in our tiny little office here in Oakland Park. But uh, as soon as I saw the interception, I just laughed because it's the quintessential preseason game, preseason play, and that this will never actually happen in a regular season game. But got some kinks out. If you are questioning this team after one preseason game or you're worried at all, I question you to go back and just watch highlights of the Super Bowl championship last year or all the success this team has had over the last few years. It's not a big deal. Um, moving on, one guy that that is a pretty big deal coming out of the game, Khalif 
Halasi had the interception, the rookie cornerback, picking off Saints quarterback Jake Hayner in the third quarter at the 46-yard line. The interception actually helped set up a Chiefs touchdown, the one that we just talked about from Shane Bouchelle to Justin Ross. It was made possible by Khalif Halasi. I'm, I'm checking to make sure that I'm pronouncing these names right because if you've listened to the show before, I butcher about every name, uh, let alone one that's not very obvious how to spell it when you first look at it, but um, talked about this again. I don't know if Khalif Halasi is going to make the Chiefs team. Don't know what his NFL career is going to look like, but not every guy who steps foot on that field is going to get an opportunity to continue doing that. And when you do get a chance to step on the field to make a play, to have a highlight that you can show your grandkids and in, in the future, but also for the mentors you have. And I, I apologize people get annoyed. I preach about this stuff, but Having a chance to just peek behind that curtain and see how many people are involved, not just with the organization, but with each individual player, from their off-season trainers to their agents to their support staff, publicists, whoever, and not that these rich people have all of these types of people around them or the people that support them, but you have people in your corner who have helped put you in a position to make that highlight to where for the rest of your life, you can say, I played on the same football field as the greatest football player to ever live. Watch this interception. Watch his reaction on the sideline afterwards that Khalif Halasi now has a play that he can point to for the rest of his life. Whatever happens with his career, he's got a play and a clip that he can show everybody. And the people that supported him can take pride in watching that play, saying, I know this guy. I know what he put into this. I know how much time he put into this. And whether it's Khalif Halasi, any of these other guys that show out during the preseason, especially that last game. I love watching that last game. Because you're getting a chance to watch guys when they make a play. You know that play is going to get clipped and be shown in that player's life. To all of his friends, anybody sitting in a bar 20 years from now saying he played in the NFL and someone, no, you didn't. He's going to pull out his phone and show an interception. Show him high five and Patrick Mahomes on the sideline. It's just a special, special thing. So shout out Khalif Alassi for, for having one of those moments uh, that you look for when not only trying to make a team, extend your career, but you get an opportunity to have a clip that you'll be able to show up for the rest of your life. All right, another thing that jumped out, we'll talk real quick on this one, just the offensive tackles, Donovan Smith at left tackle, Jawan Taylor at right tackle. I said when all of these moves happened, when they signed Donovan Smith, that I was preferring that he played on the left side, that Jawan would stay on the right side. I don't care what they paid him. I don't care what the contracts are. Leave guys where they're comfortable. Jawan Taylor's been playing right tackle. He's got to be more comfortable there than he is on the left side. Not breaking news. We knew coming out of camp where guys had been repping, but great to see those guys get in there again on the road. Not that it's super loud in a preseason game or the environment, but it's important when the adrenaline is going that the tackles and the offensive line can hear Patrick Mahomes' cadence. They know the way in which he calls plays. Yes, you can see it at training camp. They can go over it during walkthroughs. But not the same as when the adrenaline is going and they're out there on the field with fans inside a stadium that is not theirs. It's not been where they've been practicing like they have at St. Joe for however long. So shout out to the offensive line for seemingly, I think, doing a pretty good job. Um, nothing jumped out to me, um, but make sure you check out the KC Laboratory. It's going to go tonight, 8 o'clock um, on Chiefs YouTube. You can catch the podcast afterwards, but those guys, Kent, Maddie, Craig, they'll break down everything. They'll really get into the details of what they saw uh, from a film standpoint and give you some really great takes, so make sure you check that out. Um, moving along on here on 10 Things, another player that jumped out, uh, maybe still I was keeping an eye on him, but Drew Tranquil I thought was kind of all over the place. He played a lot of snaps. Uh, compared to a lot of the other guys, but I thought it was a great um, first showing for him. It was great, again, to see a linebacker out in space, running around, making plays in coverage, being right there. Uh, so I'll make a couple of quick tackles on plays where he was out uh, and moved pretty well, and that was kind of what he was known for, uh, making plays behind the limp line of scrimmage, being an athletic player there on the second level to make plays. So he had a sack that he forced as, uh, as he forced a third and long and eventual punt back to the Chiefs uh, and in that game, and then Tranquil completed the game with five tackles, three of which were solo, including the one tackle for loss on the sack, which resulted in a loss of eight yards. So shout out Drew Tranquil, and shout out that they caught him laughing after the interception uh, at the very end of the game because that was kind of, I'm assuming, a lot of people's reactions, uh, except Patrick Mahomes, who I think was uh, probably feeling for his guy, that that's got to be a pretty low feeling uh, to get that pass intercepted, knowing it's going to lead to ultimately a loss. And that's what happened. Moving along, another... Uh, takeaway just because saw and kind of stood out and it's kind of hard to miss number big old number 71 Danny Shelton uh, picking up a sack 
Um, for a player with the pedigree that Danny Shelton did as a former first round pick, a guy who's played in a lot of big games throughout his career, uh, didn't make the impact with the Chiefs last year. He spent time on the practice squad, got a Super Bowl ring. Um, don't know what kind of uphill battle he's going to have to to make this team. Maybe he'll end up back on the practice squad. Uh, maybe get a chance with another team. But it's great to see guys go out there and make plays. And great to see a big guy getting after the quarterback because it's not something Danny Shelton's necessarily known for. A lot of people are going to say, yes, nice to see him step up. Uh, Chris Jones isn't there. Again, fully expect Chris Jones to be there by the time week one rolls around. We already talked about that. Hopefully, he's got 10 days in my book, personally for me, that I think he needs to be there in order to be ready for that week one game. But uh, we'll see what happens with Danny Shelton. Could be a player. If he doesn't end up on the Chiefs team, Danny Shelton is going to be one of the six best defensive linemen on the 30-plus teams across the NFL. He's going to earn a spot on one of those. Um Let's move on. We've got two more points we're going to make. We'll wrap this show up. Uh, Shane Bouchelle uh, thought he made some plays. I think the interception was a bad one. I think if he had to take that one back, he's going to learn you can't double clutch, throw a sidearm across your body, across the field um, on a short route uh, and kind of a stick route, whatever you want to call that. Um, not a great play call or situation to kind of double clutch. And I know he had some guys around him doing some things, but that's just one of those learning experiences. You just don't make that play. But had a couple touchdowns. We talked about the one to Justin Ross, and then the one to Kakoa Crawford. Uh, that was the highlight that we saw Patrick Mahomes just lose it on the sideline. Um, and that Shane Bouchelle, I would say, it looked a little like Patrick Mahomes. Uh, just was scrambling outside the pocket, making a couple moves. You expect him to keep running to the outside. Instead, he plants his right foot, cuts back to the inside, and then finds Crawford for the touchdown on the play that, again, Talking about Shane Bouchelle, and granted, he was there last year. He has all kinds of cool memories of being in Super Bowl parades and all that. But on the field, that's one of those plays where Shane Bouchelle is going to be able to show in Kakoa Crawford. They're going to be connected forever if neither one of them make another big play that they had that moment in a preseason game. And then you immediately see Patrick Mahomes just loving uh, it for the guys that he grinds with every day. And that these guys are in meetings up at training camp. They're eating meals together. They are practicing together. They're going through walkthroughs together. They're walking around campus together. You guys spend a lot of time together. So it's pretty cool to see genuine moments where guys are rooting for their teammates and the guys that once the regular season starts, you don't want to see Shane Bouchelle on the field. No offense to Shane Bouchelle and his family. You want to see Patrick Mahomes out on the field, but it's pretty cool when he does get the opportunity that he goes out and makes a play, particularly when he kind of emulates uh, the best player in football. So uh, we'll say uh, Bouchelle finished today 11 of 18 for 155 yards. And the two touchdowns, but the one interception would have been a game winning interception or excuse me, a game winning touchdown. They threw at the end had it not been for the interception on the screen pass uh, that we won't talk about. Uh, my final thing, uh, we've got some honorable mention, but my final thing for number 10 is shout out Matt McMullen, chief senior team reporter, just crushing it on the preseason broadcast. Obviously, Matt being one of my favorite people in the world, a phenomenal dude, Chiefs fans uh, and Chiefs kingdom. We were lucky to have him being the, the conduit between the coaches, the executives and the players. And us as fans, nobody's going to work harder. Nobody's going to do it with more integrity uh, than Matt McMullen. So shout out. Love seeing him get his chance. Um, on the big screen with Kimmy Checks, thought the whole broadcast crew, Ari Trent, um, Ryan and Andy in the truck, thought they all did a phen- phenomenal job putting out a great preseason broadcast, knowing that is an internal broadcast that the Chiefs are putting out um, with uh, a lot of other people getting reps for the regular season as well. So shout out Mac, Ma- Matt McMullen. I can't talk. Shout out Matt McMullen. Uh, keep doing your thing, man. And uh, a few honorable mentions. We wrap this one up. Blaine Gabbert, uh, his first action with the Chiefs just down I-70 from where he played in college at the University of Missouri. Shout out Mizzou. That's who. That one's for Tucker. Gabbert connected with three different receivers on the day, completing four of eight passes for 59 yards and a one-yard touchdown pass to wide receiver Richie James, who was wide open, had to dive for it. Just throwing a little dig in there just to make Tucker happy. But did get the touchdown. And then Richie James, I thought there's another one that probably shouldn't be an honorable mention, uh, but I thought Richie James had a a nice performance. He had the 43-yard catch in the second quarter uh, from Blaine Gabbert, and there was three plays after that, had the one-yard touchdown on a nice little twist route, whatever it was, um, where he got open in the corner of the end zone. So great to see uh, Richie James and Blaine Gabbert um, have a little connection. But yeah, Richie James is one of those guys. Again, we spent a lot of time talking about Justin Ross. James could be one of those guys who slides in there and maybe has 500 yards receiving, 600 yards receiving at the end of the year, but they could end up being really big moments in which he makes those catches. I made that point with Justin Watson last year that you look at his box score, you look at his stats at the end of the year, not a ton, but if you go back through that stretch where the Chiefs were winning games, they should have been winning by more 
uh, some like the Denver games and some of those. Justin Watson was catching some key third and eights late when the game is close and either going in to, to put the game away or you're trying to, to take the lead late in the game or you're kind of nervous because you feel like you should be winning, but now you're thinking, hey, are we going to drop this? Is Indy all over again? Is this one of those games we're going to drop? Those are the times where a third and four, they go to Richie James and he makes the play. Those games and those plays are just as important as anything else. Getting him in a position to be confident and from Mahomes to be confident enough in him to go to him in those situations is what this preseason is going to be about. Going and doing it against somebody else and not your teammates that you've been doing it up against camp. So shout out Richie James uh, for, uh, I thought it was a great performance and one of the top takeaways personally that I would have from this game. So it shouldn't be an honorable mention. We're going to call it 11 things. We call it 11 things, Tom. All right. Last two, Shamari Connor, uh, the versatile defensive back that we talked about coming into or coming out of the draft. He was a guy that could play slot, play in the box. You could play in deep. You could move him around, do different things with him. You could blitz him. Just one of those Swiss Army knives that Steve Spagnuolo's had. We've seen a few of those guys over the years in Kansas City. Started with Hussein Abdullah. Seemed like be one of the first guys that could play a little bit everywhere, do a lot of different things for you. Obviously, Tyron Matthew did that um, just a few years ago. It's putting a lot on Shamari Connor. As far as usage and creativity and different things you can do with him, he's one of those players that you saw, obviously, with the flash blitzing um, his DB in a preseason game, but they're going to have some fun stuff for him, um, I believe. So he'll be a fun player to watch and a uh, great debut for him. And then uh, Nico Remigio, I got that one right. Our producer, Tucker, is nodding. Um, big game for him, four receptions for 71 yards. This is a player that stood out during the training camp so far. You've seen 27 have a little juice. Um, it's got a little bit more speed, a little bit more burst um, than you would normally see for a player that is honestly fighting to make a practice squad spot at this point. Um, but four catches for 71 yards, including converting three third downs with catches of 19, 22, and 24 yards. Exactly what a player like Nico Remigio, almost had it, Nico Remigio, he did exactly what he needs to do to earn a spot, whether it's on this team or on another NFL team. He's a player to watch over the next two weeks as the Chiefs starters start to get ready for the game against the Detroit Lions and the rest of the guys fight to be on either the Chiefs 53-man roster and have a chance of getting a Super Bowl ring and another one for a lot of these guys or going and playing for another team and getting out on the field. So a lot to look forward to as the Chiefs get ready for the next preseason game against the Arizona Cardinals. That's next Saturday or 14 podcasts from now here at KC Sports Network. So appreciate everybody for listening and hanging out or watching the video on this episode of 10 Things. Again, Haley Lewis will be joining us going forward. We appreciate your support of everything that we have going on. Make sure to catch The Lab. Those guys will be going tonight, uh, Monday night at 8 p.m. live, or you can listen to the podcast or watch the YouTube video after the fact. Appreciate all your support. Go Chiefs. We'll see you next time.